congregation for your giving to our trip to, to Israel. And I tell you what, that is such a blessing. And, and thank you again for what that is. And Becky, I know that you just do the appropriate song for your That was not sin. No, this is Listen, let me tell you something. Remember we were doing Family Month and uh, I told you about how that it was a, at one time statistics said that 97% of preachers' kids go alive. And so I prayed and I asked different pastors and preachers' kids about their relationship and why they're in church or not in church. And, and one pastor gave me some good advice. He said he never ran the church down in front of people. But he always wanted to let his kids have that feeling that it's good to be in a church camp. It's good to go to church and always say good things. And uh, and Tim, my son, remember what I told you during that family month. He reached over after y'all took this offering up. You remember I told you I'd always tell my kids, like if somebody brought me vegetables from their garden, I'd come in once to see it. I used to be in ministry. I used to be in ministry. And my son reached over and he said, Daddy, at least he remembers some things I've tried to teach him. <laughs> and uh, I hope and pray y'all get to know them while they're this little short while they're heading back to Nebraska uh, right after we eat together here. And uh, Tim has a real hard job. He works for the insurance companies. They're represented to the agents. And, his job is to take him out to eat and play golf. And that's really a rough job. I feel for him. And his, his wife, lovely wife, Nina, uh, she has been a financial church secretary at their church for a number of years. Just recently retired. And this is a large church. They, they have over a thousand people every Sunday morning. So it's quite an undertaking. And they'd always send her to Dallas to pay the tax laws, you know, what's the current and stuff like that, but I'm very proud of something about Nina too. When she got out of high school, she could type 100 words a minute. Can you imagine that? <laughs> Can you still do that? No. <laughs> she, she plays the piano. Tim has led music in his church many a time as an interim and things of that nature. And uh, it's just a but I'm just real proud of them. I'm going to tell you that. I thank the Lord for them and what God has done in their life. And it's just been wonderful. Well, this is going to sound dumb when I get to this message here. What I've got to say. Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put back Humpty Dumpty again. Pastor Tony Evans said, this simple nursery rhyme perfectly illustrates the state of our world and culture in which we live That's today. Right. That's right. America is broken and falling apart in many ways. I noticed the last time that Donald Trump spoke to one of his meetings that he was passing out now hats that say on it, Save America. We're at that place. We've got to save America. Now, what's going to save America? How can Humpty Dumpty ever be put back together again? Unable to resolve his crisis, Mr. Dumpty needed help. Now, who came to his help? Was it his family? Was it his friends? No. It happened to be that his help came from the king, straight from Washington, D.C. And all the king's resources and all the king's men could not put Humpty Dumpty back together again. The government is not Mr. Fix at all. The government is not our hope. Amen. You can ride on the back of a donkey for help. You can ride on the back of an elephant for hope. And of course, one of those rides is better than the other. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you something. Neither one of them are going to save America. No. 
God is the one Amen. who's going to save America. Listen to what Psalm 146, 1 through 5 says. Psalm 146, 1 through 5 says, Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, O oh my soul. While I will live, I will praise the Lord. I will sing praises to my God while I have my deed. Do not put your trust in princes, nor in the Son of Man, in whom there is no hell. His spirit departs and returns to his earth. In that very day, his plans perish. Happy is the one who has God as the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Did you hear what God said about the matter? Let it be known. This is the basic line of this. God is our source. God is our supply. God is our strength. God is our security. In God alone we trust. Matter of fact, it would really be good if we would apply that in America, our motto, in God we trust. That's where we need to go. Amen. That's where we need to find our help. For right. you see, God is our help. God is our hope. And he is the pathway to blessing. Of course, I would very well know, too, that when the righteous are in authority, then all of a sudden, like our bulletin says on the front, the people rejoice. But when they're not there, we groan. Have you been groaning lately? Yeah. We all groan, don't we, when we see people who are leading our country astray from God and God's ways. In fact, God has instructed us how to get his help. Did you know that? If we really want his help and we want God to save America, he tells us exactly, specifically, what we need to do. It's all found in 2 Chronicles, that's right, 7, 14. Now, I'm going to tell you what, this verse became famous in 1976 when America celebrated its 200th birthday, okay? And, uh, I mean, every preacher preached that passage of Scripture. Matter of fact, y'all have heard it so many times, some of you have already got that in memory without even trying to memorize it. But I'll tell you what, here's the whole key to the thing. It's one thing to hear about it. It's one thing to even sing about, sing the light, sing the light. But it's another thing to do it. To do it. What does 2 Chronicles 7, 14 say? God said this. If my people, know who that is, don't you? That's you and me. He's not talking about that congressman or that president we have now. He's not talking about anybody else. He's talking to us directly. The ball's in our court if we want to save our country. That's right. It really comes down to what we do if we follow God's word or not. We find here that it says, if my people who are called by my name, if you're calling yourself a Christian, then you're called by his name, Christ. That's right. All by my name. Well, here's what we first of all do. Humble ourselves. Humble themselves. And pray. And seek my face. And this one we don't really like to talk about. Matter of fact, a lot of preachers I've heard when they preach on this, they just skip over this part. But I'm going to deal with it. I'm going to meddle with that. Mm -hmm. Do you know what it says? And turn from their wicked ways. Who am I talking about? I'm talking about the church people. Church people have wicked ways. Not me. I'm a pretty good church goer, you know. But I hope to point out a few things, and I hope you don't imprison me or try to sound and <laughs> censor my voice today, okay? When we get to that, as I preach it, I'll be preaching to myself as well, all right? Here's what God's precise instructions are. Humble ourselves. We need to come to the place, apart from Christ, we can do absolutely. But with Christ, we can do all things. Amen. That we humbly come before him and say, God, we need you, but we need your help. 
hope. You're our only hope. You're the only pathway to blessing for us. To bless our God, bless America. Lord, you're our only hope. We humble ourselves before the Almighty God. Because he is the one with him. Nothing is impossible. There's nothing too hard for God. I tell you what, it doesn't look good at all in America. But you don't know my God. If God's people will do what our God says to do, then he's already made us a promise here that he will heal our land. I'm getting ahead of myself. But you know, he said to humble yourself. God, we need you. That's right. Amen. You are our help. You're our only help. Without you, it isn't going to happen. We've got to have you. And then we need to pray. Like we've never prayed. That's right. Now the one I keep hearing, and it's a hard one to deal with, but it comes to a time that you have to pray and fast. Fast is not in my vocabulary. <laughs> but I mean, we've got to get really serious. We need to supplicate. We need to get earnest. We need to pray with impartiality. We need to get seriously praying about it. You know, many times. We had the National Day of Prayer. I even when I first came, we had it here on a weekday. I know a lot of you work, but you know what? It's sad. One or two people will show up. They're kind of like, hey, Shabbat, Shabbat, whatever we be, we'll be. You know, I mean, I, God's in charge. He's on the throne. It's all going to happen. Yet we disobey God and don't seek his face. We don't pray. We don't humble ourselves. We don't do what he told us to do, That's whether right. we think he's on the throne or not. Yes, we're at that place that we need to humble ourselves and pray like we've never prayed before. General George Washington understood the power of prayer. On that Christmas Eve at Valley Forge, she got down on his knees and prayed. And did you know that next day when they won that battle, that was the turning point toward winning our independence? Amen. It was because of prayer, earnest prayer, desperate prayer. And they were desperate. As you know the story, you know how frozen they were and undernourished they were. You know what they were going through to do that. They knew he had to have God to have a victory. And God gave him the victory. When the War of 1812 erupted, James Madison, our fourth president, he was a godly man who knew God and knew that God was his source, his supply, his strength, his security. And so he called for a, a proclamation 18, recommending that the calling of a national day of prayer. He called on every religious organization and group to set aside one particular day that they all prayed together in unison for their nation who was in distress. He asked everyone that if they would even all the businesses would just close down that day, take a day off, and use that day primarily the whole day to just bathe the need in prayer. And in that proclamation, he also called for the joint legislation of two of the two houses. If they would together simultaneously make it as, as a union, if they would just express their common vows to God. He was looking at these, 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 these politicians here in the two houses. You know, they have common vows to God. And he said, I'm going to ask that you express that common vow to God that you have in, in your adoration of God on that occasion of prayer. Can you imagine? Do you wonder if Al Schumer or Nancy Pelosi would accept that request to have joint houses come together and to pray? Well, I will tell you this. Their party has already excluded prayer at their convention. They don't even want to recognize God or their need for God. You know, that ought to tell us we ought to pray, shouldn't we? Pray Amen. Like never prayed before. Abraham Lincoln made a similar resolution on Mark in March of 1963. 
And he was asking the nation to look to God for their help, for help and hope, to end this bloody massacre that was caused by the Civil War. And it was after that prayer that the tide began to turn. All of a sudden, the Union forces began to win the, the battles. And the Civil War came to an end. Sincerely, I'm going to tell you this. I believe with all my heart the decisions that our Supreme Justices have made and our Supreme Court are answers to many Amen. We pray that we have justices that would be constitutionalists. In other words, they went by what the Constitution said instead of, well, how I think or what I think it ought to be, and then legislate from the bench. We saw that how the, these men and women were those that would adhere to what does the Constitution say? What does the Bill of Rights say? And they made their judgments accordingly. And because of that, we were reinforced with the privilege and honor, really the right, to bear arms. And then to have religious expression, even in a public government body. <laughs> yes. And then... We also know that a great victory, because it was never in the Constitution nor in the Bill of Rights, that a woman should have the right to kill her baby in her womb if she wanted to. That was some legislation from the bench, and when those justices saw that, said, this is not proper, that needs to be something that's voted on by the people, not put down by the court. And so now it's been turned over to our state. Whereas our representatives will make those decisions and will make those votes as to what we can do is preserve the life of a baby. Yes, we need to pray like we never have. Then it says, and seek my face. Now to the Hebrews, when it talked about seeking my face, it was talking about wanting to be in or having his presence with us. Amen. I remember Moses. I pray just like Moses does all day. He said, I'm not going to go unless you go with me. <laughs> you know, I want God with me when I go. And I want to be on God's side when I go. Okay? And then we need his presence and his power. That's right. We need his presence that we can see him face to face. No, no one's ever seen God, but we can talk to him face to face like a friend talks to a friend like Abraham. We need to say, I want your attention, God. I'm, I'm going to need you. And see his face. Have you had a little kid come up to you if you were kind of reading your paper or something or watching TV, and finally they come up and they take your hand and they tell you their hand and put them on your side of your cheek, and then they look, to, look at me, Daddy. <laughs> I have something I want to say. Well, that's what we need to do. And he said, God, I need your attention. I want to have a, a, a personal audience with you, God. I want you to hear my cry. I want you to hear what I'm having to say, Lord. We need your help. You are our hope. You're our pathway to happiness, God. We need you. Amen. Now, there's one last instruction that's given in this. God says, look, if you want me to heal your land, if you want me to save America, this is something you're going to have to deal with, you're going to have to deal with it decisively. This is nothing that you just wink at and you just go on, but this, this is a, a big requirement. It is the requirement. And turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven, and I will give, forgive their sin and heal their land. Now again, we got to remember who is the we? Us. Are you? Christians. Christians. Christians have wicked ways. Now come on, don't be so innocent. Don't be so innocent. Kind of like, you know, Malachi, remember Malachi? 
he made his accusations about the people at that time and of their sins in their life. And, and he told him, he said, look, you robbed God. No, we're not robbed God, they said. I'm not a thief. And he said, no, we have robbed God of his tithes and offerings. That's not the main points of my message. I'm just trying to tell you that even God's people have sins they need to deal with. That's either, right. they, either they're honoring God or they're dishonoring God. Either they're obeying his word or they're disobeying his word. Either they're going to do this Second Chronicles, you know, 7, 14, or they're not going to do it. Which camp are you going to be in? The one that does or one that doesn't? Are you going to really make this a serious matter in your life and your prayer life to do these things? Or are you just going to say, that yeah, sure was a good preacher today. You know, I enjoyed that. I don't want it to be that. I want it to be life changing. I want it to be transformation because I love America. Amen. And I'm going to tell you, if God doesn't do it, we don't have a ghost. That's Jesus. right. We've got to really get serious about this. And not just talk the talk. And I'll tell you what. When I talk about the wicked ways of God's people, I don't know where to begin. There's too many. Unless y'all can stay after lunch, I'll come back and go through the long list of things that we have seen in our life about. <laughs> I think I told you one time, and to me it's humorous, it shows how dumb I am. <laughs> I was reading an Acts, and you know, as I, I tell you, I, I pray the scriptures, as, and I journal them, you know, as I pray the scriptures, and uh, I came to that verse of scripture where it says, and God suffered their manners in the wilderness. You know, I put up with them for 40 years, did all that whining and then griping and everything else, and I asked the stupidest question I could have ever asked. God, have you ever had to suffer my hands? I swear to God said, hey, maybe you don't have the time to hear everything I've got to say. God just puts up with us, his own people sometimes. His patience isn't always there because there has to be a payday someday. You forfeit the blessings of God if you don't obey God. That's right. Trust and obey, for there's only one way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. It's as simple as that. Hear me now, because as I was thinking about the wicked ways that comes in the Christian life, God turned my heart to different things. The Holy Spirit, I believe, went on my heart because they came from my mind. And these are, this is just starters, folks. This isn't all of them. But I tell you what, there's some that we need to deal with and we need to look at today. And you know, the Bible says in the New Testament that judgment has to first begin where? In the house of God. In other words, we've got to remove the boulder in our own eyes before we start trying to pick out the splinters out of other people's eyes. Those people there in Congress and those people that do this and have different beliefs than we do. And we're going to pull their splinter. No, we need first of all to look at ourselves. Judgment needs to begin with us. We need to really say, okay, God, where am I? What am I doing? Help me deal with my older. Surely I haven't done anything wrong. God says, let me get the older out. Now, as I deal with these wickedness, I shouldn't be fearful for myself. I'll trust God. But don't treat me like King Asa did, the seer by the name of Hanani. Hanani came to King Asa and told him how foolish he was and things that he had done wrong. And you know what Asa did? He got angry at it because he thought he was a pretty smart fellow. He had done the right thing. And just to not have to look, well, we'll look it up. Second Chronicles chapter 16, verse 7 and 9. I'll give you the story of what Hannah and I had to say. It says, And at that time, Hannah and I, the seer, came to face the king of Judah and said to him, Because you have relied on the king of Syria and have not 
not rely on the Lord your God, therefore the army of the king of Syria has escaped from your hand. Now, let me, before we go to that verse, what did King Asa do? Well, as Mr. Humpty Dumpty, he went to the king, the king of Syria, for his help. They kind of gave him some money, you know, but take care of me, you know. I'm going to rely on you. All your resources, all the king's men. I'm looking to you to do this. Well, the seer, Hannah, came and said, listen, he made a big mistake. You're pretty foolish here. And he explains why in that next verse. Let's have it now. For the Ethiopians and the Lovelin, not huge army. Let me tell you about the huge army. They were one million <coughs> man army, plus the horses and chariots. A one million army. King Asa had 300,000. But a big thing happened. Knowing that the odds were insurmountable, they cried, God, help us. We're going to rely on you. And God gave them the victory. And that's why he says, you know, wasn't that a huge army you had to go against? And yet, because you relied on the Lord, he delivered them into your hand. Are you getting this message? Amen. Amen. The message is going back to Psalm where it started out about relying upon God and not on men. That's right. Looking to God and God alone. Well, I don't know. Asa got really mad because, you know, actually it worked for him. I mean, that Syrian didn't help him out and got him out of the gym. And, you know, it did fix the problem temporarily, but he had more problems with Syria later. You know, it was like kicking the can down the street, you know. It's going to come back eventually. you got to deal with it. you got to do what's right. So anyway, when he comes to that place, Asa was just furious. And he put him in jail. And he even started kicking other people around. I'm paraphrasing. Okay? He just upset. You know, pride comes before a fall. You didn't know that. Well, I got this. God, I don't let me bother you. I don't need to rely on you. Well, yes, we do. Well, yes, we do. Now, real quickly here, if I can. What are some of the foolish things that we have done? What are the things that, besides not relying upon God, that are really our wicked ways? One of the famous failures is that we have not passed down our godly heritage to the next generation. You take street interviews of people today, and they really don't even I think sometimes know who George Washington is. Yeah. They do not know history, and they don't know the true history. And in our schools and in our colleges, it's those are revisionist of history and, and it's not the truth and they don't know any better and so they take it all in and they think now our country's a bad country and our forefathers were terrible people and they're at that place right now just simply because we did not teach them the history you know we're supposed to learn from history don't you that's know? right because when you learn from history you say well i don't want to do that or i need to do this Let me take you to Judges 2, 7. It tells us that we haven't learned from history. I'm talking to Christians in this auditorium right now, okay? We haven't learned from history. Listen to the history that was found in Judges chapter 2 and verse 7 and then verse 10. It says, So the people served the Lord all the days of Joshua and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, who had seen all the great works of the Lord which he had done in Israel. When all that generation had been gathered to their fathers, meaning going to heaven, another generation arose after them who did not know the Lord, nor the work which he had done for Israel. See, as long as those that knew God and walked with God, they did just fine, you know what I mean? So they went home to glory, but they made a major mistake by not 
not telling their children about their godly heritage. The godly men. You realize how many preachers were involved in putting the Constitution together? People who knew the Word of God, they were basing on the Word of God. And, and when they would come to a difficult decision on how should we word this or how should it be, there'd be times that there'd be heated discussions. And even Benjamin Franklin said one time, let's just stop and pray. Let's just pray about it. That's our heritage, folks. Our Constitution, well, starting with our Declaration of Independence and our Bill of Rights are all biblically based. Amen. They're founded upon the Word of God. And I'm going to tell you something. Here's the truth that God has said. He has told us in His Word that He will establish a nation. Do you know what it means to establish? You see these places of business. Established in 1969 or established in 19... They're trying to show their longevity. You know, they, hey, they've been here. They're going to be... God establishes a country, a nation that honors God and honors God's word. I'm paraphrasing, okay? Make it short. He honors them. He makes them last. Did you know our Constitution has lasted 232 years? That's miraculous, folks, because you know what the average is around the world for how long a Constitution lasts? 17 years, and then I'll change it. Ours is intact. Well, I'll tell you what, you can't get anything better than thus saith the Scripture. Amen. Thus saith the Word of God. You know, that'll establish you. The Word of God establishes you. But here's the deal. We don't learn from history. We should have learned from history. If, if there's nothing else you're learning right now, that, hey, we need to instill this. And that's one of the reasons why we brought in David Barton by way of video and just showed you all kinds of history about the godly nation and the godly people who founded it. Matter of fact, one deacon one time was shocked. He says, where are you getting all this? It's in the archives of the libraries everywhere. Microfish, where are you going to get? You can find it. It's there. It's everywhere written. Even if you go to the Capitol building. And if you look at each one of those people and who they were and what they had, it's just, wow. This is a Christian nation. A Christian people who founded this nation. I am afraid to tell you this, that Obama was right in a lot of ways, in this way, not a lot of ways, in this particular way. <laughs> that, uh, well, America's not a Christian nation. He said that. I will tell you. Let me tell you something. Our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, our Declaration, they're all Christian. They're Judeo-Christian. Mm -hmm. They're founded on the Word of God. But I'm going to tell you, that doesn't make us live like Christians. No. Nope. One of the other sins I'm going to have to go through here real fast Sins can come in two categories. They can either be the sin of commission or the sin of omission. Commission is just blatantly disobeying God, but if he told you not to say something or say something, you know, I mean, not to do that or not to do this and, and, or do this, uh, just that's a commission. Another one is omission. That's failure to do what you know you're supposed to. What he's told you, you just kind of like cop out, you know, that it, and it doesn't apply to me, or maybe I'll get around to that one day. And I think these sins is where we're really liable with Christians, because most of you in this room are, are not the baser sort of people. That's how the Bible terms it, okay? I mean, I don't usually have to see most of y'all in jail, okay? You get my drift? You kind of understand what I'm saying? I mean, we don't do this, we don't do that, we do that. But we're problem with the church and the church today as a whole, Christian people, is our sin of omission, not doing what God told us to do. That's right. Let's look at that Matthew passage of Scripture, if you would. 
Matthew chapter 5. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let your light so shine. But what do we do? Hide under a bushel. What the song say? No, don't do that. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I might get, you know, I don't know how they'll take it if I try to talk. And so we, you know, we just go into fear mode. <laughs> oh, and uh, so we're not bold. We don't let our light shine. We don't stand up real high, you know. Yes, if I'm a Christian, you know, it's what, how we like to do it, you know. My testimony, they'll know how to go to heaven. No, they won't. No, we need to. How can they believe in whom they've never heard? Unless there be a preacher. Unless somebody goes to them and tells them. You know what? We can get so upset with the world and say, I don't like the way they live and how they do things and what they think. They're just stupid. They're scared out. Did you know they're just natural? That's what a natural man does. They don't know any better. They're in the dark. And we need to take them the light that their eyes may open and say, oh, I see now. <laughs> we need to rescue the perishing. And it's wicked. Matter of fact, there's laws against it. If you see somebody who's in an accident and you don't give them assistance or they're hurting right then, that you know you can go to court and be sentenced for the crime. Let me tell you about the wickedness of the crime of a Christian. We let people just go right into hell and let them go. When we can snatch them like brands out of the fire, we can save their souls by telling them about Jesus Christ Amen. as your Savior, but we let them just go. We <clears throat> know what they really need. We know where they're headed to destruction. We've got to tell them. The other one I want to give is also in Matthew chapter 5. And these are Jesus' words in the Sermon on the Mount. Not only are we supposed to let our light so shine before men, but we have another responsibility that we are foolishly let go. It's the one on salt. Verse 14, 13 then. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? Is it then good for nothing? but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. I don't know if you realize this, but every one of us are God's salt shakers <laughs> in his hand. He wants us to just spread salt all around wherever we go in our society. Most of us understand that salt is a preservative. It's an antibacterial mineral that preserves things to last. Our society is that we want it to be a good, wholesome place to bring up your children is going to pot because we're not salting the people around us with a good and a wholesome life, an abundant life that God so wants to offer to everyone. I think about this as a salt to the earth. We need to be the kind of people that are healing the ills of our nation. We've got alcoholism, we've got drug abuse, we've got family violence, we've got immorality, the sex out of marriage, and men with men and women with women. We've got all kinds of things that are destroying the family unit. We've got all these things that are going around it. And I'm going to tell you something. We need to be salt and say, let me tell you, that's going to destroy you. I want to preserve your life. Let me give us credit. Are you ready for some credit? Y'all been good taking it real hard today, 